Welcome. My name is Erica Newman, and I am the chair of the Legislative Branch African American Affinity Group. I want to start off by saying thank you to all of you for taking the time out of your day to participate in the first virtual Juneteenth event. This is also our group's first event. Juneteenth is an important day for African Americans, as this is our day of liberation, and it's also our time to recognize and appreciate the shoulders of the giants on which we stand whether that be an aunt or an uncle, parents, grandparents, or historical figures that left behind their legacy as a blueprint on how to achieve solutions to settle the demands of equality. It was their sacrifices that has allowed us to be comfortable with combating the turmoil in this world by identifying injustices and speaking up on behalf of our race. Also, a huge thank you to my whole group for all their hard work in making this event happen and allowing me to lead in a way that I believe will educate and encourage others about history, race, and social justice. A special thank you to Mike Reed, who was co-chair of our group and has been a listening ear and a contributing voice. His wealth and knowledge on the African American race has been very valuable to our group as we navigate through today's struggles. We have a great agenda plan for today, and our hope is that you will learn something new and be inspired to do more. Before we go further, I will have Rini Nair, ESJ coordinator for the King County Council, go over the Zoom protocols. Thank you, Rini. Thank you, Erica, and good morning, everyone. It's so great to see you today. Um, so just some quick housekeeping reminders. We are, of course, on a virtual platform today, um, and there are some quick pro tips to go through so that we um, can have a meaningful experience. Um, we kindly ask you to stay muted during our session unless given permission to unmute. Um, and we encourage engagement by way of turning on your videos if you are comfortable doing so, using the chat feature to share your thoughts and questions. In order to activate your chat, there is a chat icon on the bottom of your screen. Just click that and a window will open up and you are able to then um, engage with your peers. Um, in the chat box, you will also find some reaction icons like a thumbs up and clap. Feel free to use those as well. Um, and lastly, uh, please send us any um, emails with your uh, reflections and thoughts post-gathering. We welcome all feedback. Um, it's really important to keep your devices charged because we do not want to have any kind of interruptions. And if at any point during our, our gathering today you have any kind of technical issues, um, feel free to message me um, in the chat box or you can message Sean Miller and we are on the back end on standby waiting to provide support. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Rainey. Um, I will now turn it over to Mike or before I turn it over to Mike, I just wanna say that during this session, we'll go over our mission statement, land acknowledgement, shared interests and um, a few other topics. So stay tuned. Uh, let me turn it over to Mike now, where he'll be reading the African American Affinity Group mission statement. Mike. Thank you. Can people hear me? Yes. All right. So this is the uh, African American um, Affinity Group mission statement. So the Black African American Affinity Group consists of individuals who are diverse in age, gender, sexual orientation, disability, and job classification. All members self-identify and relate to the cultural dynamics of African Americans around the globe. The purpose of this group is to build trust, fellowship amongst each other, to share experiences and coordinate events and educate others about the inequities and injustices that Black people encounter every day on every platform, as well as the pervasive race-inflected structures and histories that underlie those inequities. Our hope is that others will learn something about uh, something new about Black people and become an ally by acknowledging our daily struggles, by being accountable for any contribution to that that further perpetuates racism against Black people, and consider becoming a catalyst for change by investing in learning opportunities and doing more to help the American people. We welcome the opportunity to collaborate with other groups uh, to advance racial and social justice. And then finally, there's a, a, a quote from Malcolm X, if you are not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving people who are doing the oppressing. 
Um, so I'd like to introduce um, John Miller. John is the, uh, the founder of the executive side, African American, Black African American Affinity Group. John. Thanks, Mike. I am co-founder. There were uh, many of us um, that stepped up to the plate to kind of build this out. So I do not stand alone, have never stood alone, and I anticipate never, ever having to stand alone. Um, thank you for welcoming me over in this familial, sp familial spirit of collaboration. Inlock Etch, Indigenous Mayan, for you are my other me. Mbutu, Bantu, for humanity. I am John Miller, son of D, Johnny, Pete, and Karen, grandson of Leola, Lawrence, Cecilia, Aquila, partner of Lakeisha, father of Kyrie, Esaias, Jaden, and Jeremiah. I am imperfection in pursuit of excellence. Again, I thank you for having me. I am here in solidarity with my sisters and brothers in the legislative branch. With that, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the great spirit, the creator, or whatever you acknowledge as greater than you. I'd like to also acknowledge those ancestors that came before us. Uh, we stand on their shoulders. Without them, we would not be who we are and where we are. This includes the many who we have lost to racism, police violence, COVID-19, Dominic Remy Fells, Rhea Milton, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Manuel Ellis, Breonna Taylor, Charlena Lyles, and thousands of others. June 19th, 1865, and we're still honoring your legacy and living to achieve true emancipation for all of us. I'd also like to take this time to call in to be intentional around our Native brothers and sisters um, in this struggle um, I want to pay tribute to them and their stewardship of this land and our responsibility to follow their lead in stewarding this land. Our Native brothers and sisters have never been ones to own this land, right? It was about being the stewards, and we should follow their lead in that space. I want to call into this, this, um, this time the Coastal Salish, Duwamish, Lumi, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, and Puyallup. Thank you. I appreciate your sacrifice. I value your brotherhood and sisterhood. I have the next slide, so I will go ahead and just seamlessly transition into that. Um, I'd like folks to kind of just marinate on this poem by Brother Han uh, that was shared with me by Janine Anzalota, who received it from the Trauma Stewardship Institute. I hold my face between two hands. No, I am not crying. I hold my face between my hands to keep my loneliness warm. Two hands protecting, two hands nourishing, two hands to present my soul from leaving me in anger. With that being said, I'd like to put a charge out there to all of the branches of our government. That includes the executive which, in which I work, the legislative branch which is hosting this wonderful, beautiful celebration in honor of our emancipation true emancipation, and the judicial branch. We have to move beyond our paradigms to imagine the community of love, health, and belonging. When you think about your body, how do you respond to your body's ailments? Do you ignore them? Do you acknowledge them, treat them, monitor them, get to a space of healing? When we stop looking upon ourselves as different bodies and look upon ourselves for what we truly are, one body, then shall we realize our true potential to create healthy, trustworthy, sustainable systems that benefit our whole. Paradigm shifts from the power struggle of us versus them, silos, hierarchy, exclusion, division. Divisiveness has cost us as a public servants and the communities we are here to serve. I'd like to leave you with these questions to just ponder as we continue to celebrate Juneteenth. What if we held the biggest picture possible of what we could be over pointing out our limitations? What if we came to expect greatness instead of failure or inadequacy? What if we treated, treated failure as a form of fast learning and not as disgrace? What if we acknowledged people's strengths instead of picking at their flaws? Imagine a world compelling vision set loose to create and prosper with unabated support, encouragement, and celebrate it transformative world. I'm honored to share this space in this time, in this manner, with all of you. Thank you.
Wow, thank you, John, uh, for those powerful words. And thank you for being here today. On behalf of our group, we are looking forward to future collaborations. I'm gonna now turn it over to the chair of the King County Council, Claudia Balducci, for the reading of the Juneteenth Proclamation. Thanks, Erica. Uh, and thank you uh, so much to the King County Council African American Affinity Group for putting on this amazing event. Uh, it's incredible. And I'm really honored to be invited here today. Just a few quick words before I share the council's proclamation. Uh, I looked back uh, in preparation for this event at the words of the order that was announced in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865. And they're striking in that they say, uh, in part, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And it goes on from there. But it struck me that, of course, we know today that the absolute equality of rights was not achieved at that time. Two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, neither was it fully achieved after the 13th Amendment was later adopted. Uh, and as Professor Michelle Alexander powerfully points out, the racial caste system in America did not end there. It merely changed and adapted, as we saw first with Jim Crow, then with the war on drugs and mass incarceration and other systems of control which persist today and result in ongoing racial disparities that we know very well here in King County affect every stage of life. We see resulting in so much pain and the rightful protests on our streets today. Uh, so on behalf of the council, I'm honored and very delighted to join you in celebration today, while we also keep at the front of our mind and our work what we need to do to make good on the promise of Juneteenth over 150 years later. Uh, we started that work at the county council this week by voting to advance several police accountability measures that are within our authority here at King County. Uh, but there's much more to do over the short and long term, and I really hope to be back here uh, or one of our member back here to report with a lot more progress and positive change that we can all do together. And with that, I will read the proclamation. Whereas Juneteenth recognizes and commemorates the day of June 19, 1865, when enslaved African Americans in Texas were informed by Major General Gordon Granger that they were free, ending 246 years of chattel slavery. And whereas the Emancipation Proclamation was enacted by President Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863, but resistance to the executive order, as well as continued fighting in the state of Texas regarding the abolishment of slavery, significantly delayed the freedom of slaves. And whereas on June 19th, 1866, one year after Major Granger's announcement, the freed African American men and women in the state of Texas held the first Juneteenth or African American Independence Day celebration, and Juneteenth celebrations would later spread to all corners of the country. And whereas the state of Texas became the first state in our nation to make Juneteenth an official holiday in 1979, followed by 41 other states that recognized Juneteenth as a state holiday or holiday observance, and whereas for people of African descent in this country, Juneteenth is the closest occasion of a true Freedom Day to celebrate, and whereas in King County, Juneteenth will be celebrated this year in people's homes and in vo virtual celebrations online, such as the Juneteenth Week programming by the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. And whereas amid the coronavirus crisis, the historic Black Lives Matter movement and the necessity of being counted in the 2020 census, mutual understanding, sense of community and working together for the common good have become increasingly important values. Now, therefore, we, the Metropolitan King County Council, proclaim June 19th, 2020 as Juneteenth in Martin Luther King Jr. County, recognize its historic importance, and encourage all residents to join us in celebration, dated this 19th of June, 2020, and signed by all nine members of the King County Council. Thanks again for allowing me to be here and uh, read that proclamation. And I look forward to learning more and hearing more powerful words from you all today. Thank you so much, Chair Balducci, for being here today and making time to uh, read the proclamation. Without further ado, I wanna go further into our agenda and turn it over to Mike Reed uh, as he will present Juneteenth history. 
Mike. Thank you, Erica. Um, so uh, much of the, the discussion about Juneteenth history has been touched on by some of the earlier speakers. So I'll kind of move through this part pretty quickly. Um, and then I'll do one uh, spoken word piece. Um, so uh, as uh, Chair Balducci mentioned, uh, June uh, 10th began on June 19th of 1865. That's the day that General Gordon Granger uh, read federal orders in Galveston, Galveston Texas, uh, uh, confirming that all previously enslaved people, as the proclamation put it, uh, are hereby free. Um, at that time, the Civil War had largely ended um, at the Appomattox Courthouse uh, in, uh, in Virginia, I believe, with, Lee, with General Lee's surrender in, on April 9, 1865. Um, the slaves in Texas were held for an additional two months after the end of the, the war, and for more than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, which was again in, in uh, January of 1863. Uh, President Lincoln had actually been assassinated uh, what, uh, two months before uh, the, the, the date of the freeing of the slaves in Texas. That is, he, he was shot on April 14 of 1865, again, two months before. Um, so he did not see the real end of the war. Um, the the uh, freeing of the slaves in Texas on June 19th is looked on um, as the date that slavery actually ended in the United States. It has been celebrated since then, um, sometimes more, sometimes less, by the African American community um, uh, over the course of the intervening years. Uh, there have been efforts uh, to nationally to achieve national recognition for Juneteenth as a federal holiday. That has so far not happened. Uh, in many respects, uh, as has been said earlier, the ending of slavery was a new birth for Afri African Americans in this nation. The first acknowledgement of our humanity as a people and as individuals, it was a brand new day. Um, and that is true irrespective of any federal acknowledgement. Um, so I want to do one brief piece, and you'll recognize this. This is a, uh, this is, um, a, a piece of spoken word by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, as you know, is a, uh, a poet from the early, early 20th century, actually born in the late 19th century. Um, and he's one that's well known and well celebrated by the African American community. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts. We smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but O oh the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back uh, to Erica. Oh, Mike, that was deep. Thank you for um, providing us with that background. Uh, I think it's much needed as we move forward. Um, and for others to understand as we move forward and understanding today's atrocities and its connections with the past. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Rhonda and she will talk about uh, communication to and amongst African Americans. Thank you so much, Erica, and thank you, Mike, for uh, sharing of yourself and your creativity. Some of the remarks that I'm going to make um, are, they may sound repetitive, and it makes me think of a time when I was uh, complaining to a friend about my children, and I said, you know, I can share an idea, and it falls on deaf ears, but someone else shares the same idea, and they say, oh, that's great, let's do that, and what my friend said to me was that, you know, sometimes one person plants the seeds, and another person waters them. And what's really important is the crop that results and the harvest that results. So some of the things I'm gonna do today is a watering of seeds that have already been planted, amplifying some words that have already been said. And then I hope to plant some new seeds that will give you things to think about. So as you heard from Mike, and as you've heard from uh, our council chair in the proclamation, 
Juneteenth is the oldest celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. It goes back to 1865 when so, uh, Union soldiers landed at Galveston, and this was two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. One of the things that I think is ironic about um, the words of General Granger, his first order of business was to read this general order number three. And that order began with this word, this, these phrases. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States. The people of Texas are informed. So two full years after enactment of the Emancipation Proclamation is when the informing happened. So over time, there have been several explanations offered as to why it took so long. One of the stories is that the messenger was murdered on his way to Texas with the news of freedom. Another story is that the news was deliberately withheld by the enslavers in order to maintain a labor force on the plantations. A third story is that federal troops actually waited for the slave owners to reap the benefits of one last cotton harvest King Cotton before going to Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation. So I want to ask us to think about this. How are we staying informed today? Of all the Juneteenth stories, all of them could be true, none of them could be true, but we do know that there is such a thing as revisionist history and playing fast and loose with facts. It's well known that our history or events in our community have not been told. How many of us learned about the Tulsa race massacre? I was fortunate enough to have grown up in Oklahoma in segregated schools where I did learn about that. But how, how many of the rest of us learned about that and when did we learn? What do we know about Rosewood in Florida? Again, was it two years after these things uh, actually happened? like Juneteenth and the Emancipation Proclamation. So fast forward and we think about current events. Who is sharing the news of uh, things that are gr of great importance to our community members? If you see the, the points on the slide here, um, information uh, is needed for trans in order for transformation to happen. So who is sharing our news? What images are used to portray African Americans? We learned just recently where Fox News admitted to showing Photoshop pictures in its news coverage, giving the impression that Seattle was burning to the ground. Um, I had family members from all over the country call me and ask me what was going on. So how quickly does the reality and the imagery of peaceful protests morph in the short time it takes from the, for the participants to arrive at their homes after taking part in those peaceful demonstrations, how long does it take for those to morph to become portrayed as riots and looting? Does what actually happened in Seattle look like this? Rini, could you put up slide one, please? Did it look like this? Rini, could you change to slide two, please? Or does it look like this? Whose truth is being told? Which photos have been seen by your out-of-town friends? So where we used to be printed, dependent on the printed word, now with technology, computers, and smartphones, we have so many opportunities for the dissemination of the news. And those opportunities are both timely and they provide broad coverage. Just as we have fought against revisionist history, let us become diligent about how current events are portrayed and recorded as it pertains to us. So on the right hand side, or my right, uh, of this uh, slide, I've compiled a list of websites and newspapers that I would encourage us to make part of our menu of news sources. Right here in Seattle, we have the Seattle Medium, we have KRIZ, KZIZ radio for those of us who are in their transmission zone. There's Rainier Avenue radio, there's Africatown News, Black Dot radio. And uh, just recently, uh, a young man from Seattle who currently um, 
lives in Brooklyn, New York, has created a series called Stolen. I'll put it in the chat. It's Stolen series by Adrian Brandon. And he uses his art to communicate what is happening to us. And it's powerful communications. So these websites, I think, are going to be available to us. And they will give us a perspective that we're not going to get anywhere else. So in closing, I would like to leave you with just this thought. We're no longer dependent on men on horseback to deliver our news. So just as General Granger's order number three read, the people of Texas are informed, let's ensure that we, our families, and folks in our sphere of influence are informed, and that that information is happening by those who take seriously the responsibility to tell our stories honestly, positively, and in a timely manner. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rhonda, for covering all of what you just did. Um, I think you hit it right on the nose. Um, and for that, we're going to move into the next item, which is mass incarceration by Tillery Williams. Thank you, Erica, and thank you to everyone uh, who has taken the time out from their work and busy lives to join us today. Um, to everyone that has taken the time out to join us during this celebration, I am here to tell you today that while Juneteenth is a momentous day in U.S. history, it is important to appreciate the civil rights and liberties promised to African Americans that have yet to be fully realized. This reality is a consequence of Jim Crow laws and the proliferation of incarceration that began in the 1970s, including the increase of people placed in pretrial pre pre detention and other criminal justice policies. There are more than 2.3 million people currently incarcerated in America, including those not convicted of any crime. Black people alone comprise 40% of them, even though they represent just 13% of the U.S. population. Again, I state Black people comprise 40% of the people currently incarcerated in, Americans, in, in America's prisons and jails, even though they represent just 13% of the U.S. population. More troubling is the number of incarcerated individuals currently held in jail for crimes of which they have not yet been convicted. Over a half million citizens are languishing in pretrial detention. And like most criminal justice outcomes, the burden of this disproportionality falls on minorities, especially black men and women. In local jails alone, over 300,000 people are awaiting are waiting trial for property, drug or public order crimes. These disproportionately black defendants are confined and separated from their families, friends, and jobs simply because they lack the means to post cash bail, which in most cases is the only reason they can't get out. But I wanna speak on one really big problem in the African-American community. One of the most prevalent consequences of the discriminatory incarceration of African Americans is the toll it takes on our families. It should be no surprise that one in nine black children now has a parent behind bars, compared with the national rate of just one in 28. And many of these children are at an increased likelihood of experiencing physical and mental health issues academic struggles, and a range of other behavioral problems. Children of incarcerated mothers are also at heightened odds of ending up in foster care and being exposed to other traumas. Being the partner of an incarcerated individual is another often stressful experience that also falls disproportionately on Black citizens, particularly Black women. So to reiterate, Children suffer, parents struggle, relationships diminish, and as a result, so do so many of our African American communities. Lost wages matter to families, but they also matter to communities. 
the lower tax base that results makes it more difficult for struggling public institutions like schools to progress. And with such a large share of individuals removed from some communities due to incarceration and branded as felons upon their release, these communities lose potential voters and the political capital they carry. They are too often disenfranchised and stripped of their full power and potential. But I say to you, however, with all of these struggles that many other races and ethnicities don't have to overcome as frequently to exist in this burdensome society, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. The good news is that such injustices are receiving growing attention nationwide. Praise God. To those of you participating on this call, Juneteenth celebrates, celebrates the freedom of Black Americans and the long, hard road they were forced to travel to gain that freedom. But as the very simple statistics show time and time again, the US criminal justice system remains biased against African Americans. Thank you for your time. And I challenge you all to do what you can to continue to bring awareness to this issue. Wow, thank you so much, Tillery. Um, I think you, you delivered the message well. Um, it, it, I think people should understand that mass, mass incarcerations is one of the layers of um, issues that African Americans face. And I started to think of many other layers and just thinking about in perspective when we got hit with the pandemic, how they, um, they were trying to find ways to put people out, but it never really said if it was black people in particular. So um, I'm gonna move forward with, um, Mike, do you, do you have any additional comments or? Um, yeah, I was, okay. I, I was gonna do a, a, a piece on um, um, a reflection and um, evaluation analysis of um, some of the uh, some key elements of the revolutionary and, um, and civil wars. Um, so yes. I, I will start by uh, asking people to remember uh, the name Crispus Attucks, um, you may recall Crispus Attucks was one of the, I believe, three or four people who were um, killed uh, in a, an event in 1775, referred to as the Boston Massacre. He was an African American. Um, he is one African American name that is handed down through our history, through American history, uh, to us uh, to, in some, acknowledge that uh, we were, as a people, involved in the initial shedding of blood in the uh, Revolutionary War. Um, a piece of history that has not been handed down, at least not in my experience, um, I'll refer to as the 20,000. So the 20,000, um, you may or may not know, and I certainly did not know, um, that, uh, that um, the, uh, th that there were 20,000 African Americans who fought on the British or loyalist side in the Revolutionary War. Um, there were 5,000 African Americans uh, who fought on the Patriot side. So 5,000 to 20,000, four to one, four African Americans on the British or loyalist side for every one fought on the Patriot side. So that raises some profound questions. Why? Uh, why uh, has history denied us uh, this understanding? Now, it could be said, and maybe this is true, that it was out of kindness to the African-American community uh, in the fervor of uh, embracing patriotism after the war and in the years since, um, uh, that uh, there was a, a disinclination to, uh, 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 to note uh, the uh, commitment of the African-American community or the large parts of it to the British cause. or um, did it undermine a narrative that was trying to be born? Um, and that is the legitimacy of the revolutionary project. Um, and when I say that, uh, just to elaborate, it raises the question, who was fighting for freedom? So uh, the claim of the Patriot side was um, that, uh, that uh, the British were taxing uh, the, uh, the American colonies without representation, 
um, importing tea against the wishes of the American colony. That was the nature of the, of the claims and objections. There were other uh, claims as well. Um, on the side of the 20,000, and I'm referring again to the 20,000 African Americans who fought on the Loyalist or British side, um, they were seeking freedom from chains. They were seeking freedom from metal chains around their uh, legs and around their arms um, and around their necks. Uh, they, were they were seeking uh, relief from the raping of 12-year-old girls, uh, from breaking up of families for sale, uh, from uh, denying slaves the ownership of their very own bodies. Um, that is the nature of the claim that the 20,000 were fighting for. Uh, which of those two claims has most valence? Um, the, what happened, uh, uh, and I, I provide one piece of context, um, the, pro, the Dunmore Proclamation. So that uh, Lord Dunmore uh, of the British, a general in the British military, uh, proclaimed in 1775 that any African Americans who were enslaved at the time uh, who would uh, leave their slave masters and come fight with the British uh, would, be, would be freed. Um, so a promise was made for our freedom uh, at that time uh, by the British. Um, thousands did run from slave masters uh, to British lines. And again, as I noted, 20,000 of them ended up uh, as uh, in fighting for the British. Um, history has given us Crispus Attucks. History has not given us the voices of those 20,000. And my argument is that um, we, at least the African American community, and I think American history as a whole, would be deeply enriched by knowing that history, by having a line of communication with that 20,000. Their voices are silent. We have not had the benefit of, of what they would say. Um, what would they say? They, what, they would say, certainly, that we existed. We were flesh and blood. They would say that we fought for our status as human beings. They would say that our defeat meant another century, almost, another 80 or 90 years of American slavery. Uh, they would say that our truth has never been heard. Uh, they would say that the American truth is a selective truth. So I'll quickly ask you to fast forward uh, in time to 1861. You may recognize that as the date of the start of the uh, American Civil War. Um, the historical narrative of the Civil War is that it was fought to free the slave. That's what American history says, and that's what we're told. And, and uh, for the most part, America embraces that, that story. I wanna provide a little bit of context. In 1862, the war was going badly for the North. The Civil War was. Uh, there were, had been a series of major defeats and recruitment efforts uh, on the part of the North were plummeting. Uh, the white community was unwilling to support the war effort. In September, 1862, uh, President Lincoln issued the Preliminary Emancip Procl Emancipation Proclamation. Um, basically saying that if the South does not come to terms, we will free the slaves. Now, implicit in that, though not explicitly stated, was if the South does not come to terms, the sl slaves will not be freed. That's critical because it says that the war was not about slavery. The war was, a, uh, this was a military, uh, military uh, strategy. Um, in January, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was issued, and I'm going to characterize that as the second Emancipation Proclamation, uh, because recall, Lord Dunmore issued uh, the first Emancipation Proclamation in, eight, in 17, um, 1775. Um, that uh, second Emancipation Proclamation uh, applied only uh, where the South still resisted. Uh, the border states would be allowed to keep their slaves under that proclamation. Uh, the uh, proclamation allowed uh, African Americans to serve in the military, and this is critical. 200,000 uh, African Americans did eventually serve in uh, the North uh, forces uh, in the Civil War. Uh, that was a higher proportion of, uh, of uh, service per population of any demographic uh, who served in the war. Those 20,000 made the difference in winning the war. Um, again, recruitment had plummeted on the part of the white community. Uh, and as a result of the new energy brought by uh, those 200,000, the South eventually was exhausted. There were bread riots in the South 
uh, because forced labor had ended, um, or at least the, the slaves had left the plantation in, in large numbers. Uh, again, thousands of slaves ran to union lines. Um, this was, again, specifically a military measure and was not for the purpose of, not for a moral purpose. Uh, freeing the slaves uh, was to accomplish a military purpose. Um, again, there was no promise that slavery as a whole would be ended uh, as a result of uh, that service. Um, the larger truth is that the South fought to preserve slavery, but the North did not fight to end it. The North fought, fought to preserve the Union. Link, Lincoln was very clear about that. Um, the war effort uh, was central to the victory of, the, of the, uh, the war effort by the enslaved was central to the victory of the North, and it did in fact preserve the Union. So for those of us who have, uh, for, for America, this nation, which has um, 50 states, um, that union was preserved by the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and the service of African Americans in the Civil War. Um, so you'll notice strong parallels between the efforts of the enslaved in the, Revol in the American Revolution and the Civil War. Uh, so for example, um, as noted, emancipation was a military project. Um, large numbers of enslaved uh, led their masters and joined the columns of what I'll refer to as the freedom troops. Uh, large numbers of enslaved fought for freedom with those freedom troops. There are also some differences. In the case of the Civil War, our service for the North is celebrated. In the case of the Revolutionary War, our se service in the cause of freedom is simply not said. Not acknowledged, not celebrated, simply not said. Why does this matter? It confirms that we cannot accept the story being told us. It demonstrates that American history is used to manipulate our reality and raises questions as to the veracity of American historians. It suggests that institutional racism, in this case, the institution of American history, has deep, deep roots. It raises uh, questions about the legitimacy of the American project. It gives the lie to the idea that African Americans never rebelled. In fact, we did, and the, the Revolutionary War was, was one of many occasions. It suggests that if a narrative of ancestral glory and sacrifice is part of the construction of a healthy human personality, then depri deprivation of that narrative is weaponizing history to support the destruction of the African American personality. Um, so that is, uh, those are the reflections on the Civil and, and Revolutionary War. I hope that adds some insight. I'm happy uh, if you wanna contact me afterwards to provide you citations to what I've said. Um, thank you for the time. Wow, thank you so much, Mike. You always come through with the facts. Um, and I think that was a, a great uh, gateway to what we're gonna cover next, which is the story of uh, Emmett Till uh, by Chandler Gayton. So everybody, um, as Erica mentioned, I'm gonna be giving a brief background of what happened with Emmett Till, uh, paralleling that with how black mothers have to deal with their children today and the constant struggles that they deal with and just thinking about their safety, as well as giving the history of uh, a little bit of my family and uh, my experiences with uh, the police. So in 1955, a 14 year old Emmett Till was kidnapped from his uncle's house, brutally beaten and killed by Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam for allegedly whistling at a white woman. Uh, Till's body was uh, then found in the Tallahassee River in Money, Mississippi, uh, tied by barbed wire his eyes were gouged and a 75 pound cotton gin fan was uh, tied to his back. Uh, his face was mutilated past recognition and was only identified by um, a ring of his father that was identified by his uncle. Uh, Till's mother, um, God bless her, decided to have an open casket funeral. Uh, she flew him back to Chicago where he was originally from so the world could see the atrocities that had been done to her son. Uh, this, is one of the, this was one of the defining factors for starting the civil rights movement. Um, later, an all-white jury acquitted both Bryant and Millam, and in 2007, uh, Carolyn Bryant, uh, Till's accuser, admitted that she had lied about uh, Till making advances toward her. So Emmett Till was killed for nothing, and it, to make matters worse, uh, the advances never did happen. So thinking about that with Black mothers today in the world, uh, my mother, I know for sure, uh, she still tells me that she is constantly worried about me, that she worries about 
just me walking down the street, me driving. Uh, and this is a real fear uh, to be a 30 year old man and my mother still telling me these things. It's, uh, I remember getting the talk as a young man saying, you can't do what your white friends do. Um, just point blank period, I said you are black. Uh, but for the next portion of this, uh, I wanna provide context in my family story. Uh, there's often a misconception that these incidents only happen to, to black people that are, uh, when I say these instances, uh, police encounters or uh, racism to, to quote unquote disadvantaged black people who, who don't follow the law. But um, my family's been involved with reformation of the system uh, before America was America. I mean, my great great grandfather, uh, Lewis Clark, was a runaway slave who was an abolitionist, uh, constantly worked with other abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe actually took uh, my great-great-grandfather's story and made it into the likeness of the character George Harris. So uh, fast forward to 1942, uh, my grandparents were the first black family to block bust the Central District. Uh, my, my father, Carver, was the first black FBI agent from Washington State, uh, first black coach at the University of Washington. Uh, Sports Illustrated labeled him as the most dangerous coach in the country when he quit after black players were kicked off the football team under Jim Owens. Um, he, led, he went on to do a number of other jobs, such as working for the NSA, working as the Commissioner of Employment Security under Governor Gary Locke, becoming the first director of the Northwest African American Museum, and received numerous death threats uh, for his positions, as well as my Uncle Gary, who represented the Black Panthers and worked under Jimmy Carter for the Department of Transportation. And so once again, I wanna say this to provide context of my family and not to boast or brag, but just to say that uh, I've had people at King County who have said, oh, you're a, a privileged black, black man, or you act white as if being educator in my position nullifies my experience of racism or what uh, I know about my history. And so um, I will say that I've made mistakes. I make mistakes every day. I'm not perfect. I'm a man. But um, I pray that nobody has to have these experiences of uh, the encounters with the police about me. Um, I'm a black man who's also, uh, before I go into this, I want to just state that I'm, I'm opening up to you about my encounters with the police. I, I hope that you guys know me uh, and you will not judge me for what I'm about to say, but these are things that have happened. Now. I'm a black man who's had... Uh, knees to my neck uh, to the point where my face has been bruised, where I was choked and no pictures were taken because it showed that excessive force. I've had false police reports written about me on numerous occasions and were not addressed until they were called out. I've, I've, had, police, I've had police reports written about me uh, from officers for just following me, not even pulling me over, just flat out following me and it wasn't until there was a legitimate traffic infraction where I learned about this. And thankfully I, I knew the officer who it was which was the only saving grace for me. Um, received speeding tickets for going 37 miles per hour of the speed limit, which also called for additional four squad cars to come to the scene while I was less than a block away from my house and was charged a $600 ticket for it. I've had police write nationwide alerts that I'm a threat to police and which resulted in me and my mother being held at gunpoint at the Canadian border by over a dozen officers. And I pray that nobody has to deal with the trauma, the fear, and the anger of having to coach your mother on how to de-escalate a situation with the police by having guns pointed at them. And that is not the only time that I've had guns pointed at me as a, uh, from police officers. Um, I'm also a black man when I go to South Carolina to visit my, my mother's uh, family, my, my grandparents, my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, where if I jog when I'm working out, my uncles have to come outside the house to make sure that I'm not too far into the white area. Uh, because they don't wanna see anything happen to me, specifically uh, referencing to Ahmaud Arbery, where he didn't have that luxury of having his family at the time come after him to make sure that he was okay. But uh, this is a part of the South and my mother heard Klan meetings. She saw the burning crosses. Um, and so I say all that to say, these experiences happen every day to people that you know that you work with, this is not it's not a one-off type of situation, but um, I pray that we can, and I hope that we can continue to be intentional about helping those who are uh, the most marginalized because uh, we really can make a difference and it, and it, it really does take us to, to really change the society. So uh, thank you for the time, Erica and everybody else who's presented. 
Thank you so, so much, Chandler. And I think, you know, you brought up an important point about how Black mothers teach their son from birth on how to be and how they're perceived in society. You know, the unfortunate part of this all is that so many mothers go through the heartache and lifetime of pain of having to bury their children. And we know all too well now about um, the mothers of George Floyd. Um, I seen on the news today that the half brother of Robert Fuller, who was found hanging from a tree in California, his half brother was killed by the, uh, the police last night. And so I think, you know, as we go forward, it, it, it is very important that we keep these issues on the forefront because I think that we need to start, we need to continue to educate uh, others on what it, how, we, how, how it feels to walk in society with brown skin. So thank you so much for that. Um, next, uh, we have Renita Borders um, giving us a presentation. Uh, Renita, go ahead and take it away. Thank you everyone for taking the time and all the presenters, your, the information has been exceptionally well presented and very informative. The next position person will, at this time will be Rodney King. So on March 31st of 1991, Rodney King was caught by the Los Angeles police after a high speed chase. He was pulled from his car and severely beaten by four police officers while others stood by watching talking about the beating. All of this was caught on videotape and broadcast to the nation and the world, which, for which he became a symbol of racial tension in America. His injuries included skull fractures, broken bones and teeth, and a permanent brain damage. Although the four LAPD officers were indicted on charges of assault with a deadly weapon and excessive force by a police officer, they were acquitted on the charges after a three months trial. The predominantly white jury, which consisted of 10 white people, one Hispanic and one person, not a single African-American. This acquittal in April 1992 triggered five days of riots in South Central Los Angeles, an area already experiencing increased tension due to an unemployment rate at 50%, the drug epidemic, gang activity, and high violent crime. A few statistics. Over 50 people were killed, over 2,000 people were injured, and over 9,500 were arrested, of which 36% were African American and 51% were Latino. And they were arrested because of the, for rioting, looting, and arson, which contributed to about a billion dollars in property damage. On the third day of the riots, Rodney King stood outside to public appeal to Los Angeles residents and stated the famous plea, people, I just want to say, you know, can't we all get along? Can we all get along? Eventually, federal civil rights charges would be filed by the United States Department of Justice against the four officers. And in August of 1992, two of the officers would be found guilty and the other two would be acquitted. Now, although Rodney King was a skilled swimmer and surfer on June 17, 2012, he was found unconscious at the bottom of the swimming pool and eventually pronounced dead at a local hospital at the age of 47. Thank you. Wow, Renita, thank you so much for that. Um, just looking at our agenda, you got the next few items. So uh, <laughs> let's move on into um, the story of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, born into slavery in Maryland. She escaped to freedom in the North in 1849 to become the most famous conductor on the Underground, underground Railroad. She crossed into the free state of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania with a feeling of relief and awe and recalled later, when I found I had crossed that line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields and I felt like I was in heaven. Harry Tubman suffered lifelong headaches and seizures and had vivid dreams due to traumatic head injuries suffered when she was a child trying to stand up for a fellow field hand. These symptoms gave her powerful visions which she ascribed to God which helped her to guide her trips to the North and leading others to freedom. Tubman risked her life to lead hundreds of family members and other slaves from the plantation system to freedom on this elaborate secret network of safe houses. Between 1850 and 1860, Tubman made 19 trips from the South to the North following this network known as the Underground Railroad. She guided more than 300 people, including her parents and several siblings from slavery to freedom, earning the nickname Moses for her leadership. The dynamics of escaping slavery changed in 1850 with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, which stated that escaped, escaped slaves could be captured in the North and returned to slavery, 
leading to the abduction of former slaves and free blacks living in free states. Law enforcement officials in the, in the North were compelled to aid in the captive slaves regardless of their personal principles. In response to this law, Tubman rerouted the Underground Railroad to Canada, which prohibited slavery categorically. In, 19, in December of 1851, Tubman guided a group of 11 fugitives, fugitives to, no, northward. And to some degree, there's evidence to suggest that the party stopped at the home in, of abolitionist and former slave Frederick Douglass. Tubman remained active during the Civil War, working for the Union Army as a cook, a nurse, and quickly became an armed scout and spy. She was the first woman to lead an armed expedition in the war, and she guided the Combahee River Raid, which liberated more than 700 slaves in South Carolina. After the, after the Civil War ended, Tubman dedicated her life to helping impoverished former slaves and the elderly. She also was an active proponent of the women's suffrage, working alongside Susan B. Anthony. Harriet Tubman died of pneumonia on March 10, 1913, surrounded by friends and family at, the, at around the age of 93. That concludes Harriet Tubman. Yes, now going into Mega Everett, you're, man, Renita, you're, you're killing it. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you. Medgar Wiley Evers. During the period of 1953 through 1963, Medgar Evers was one of Mississippi's most impassioned activists, orators, and visionary for change. He fought for equality and he fought against brutality. His murder made him a martyr to the cause of the civil rights movement. Evers enlisted in World War II as a veteran, and was a veteran who served in the segregated U.S. Army. He participated in the Normandy invasion and served in France and Germany until he was honor honorably discharged in 1946. He eventually attended and graduated from- Hey, Al sorry. Um, he eventually attended and graduated from Alcorn Agricultural and Mechanical College, which is now Alcorn State University, where he earned honors as one of the most successful students in the nation and was named to the who's who among American college students. His decision to attend college afforded critical exposure and experiences that contributed to his development as an emerging activist and eventual leader of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. Evers became aware um, of the NAACP during one of his interracial seminars that he attended. During this time, Evers also volunteered to become, Evers volunteered to become the first black applicant to apply in the University of Mississippi Law School. His application was subsequently rejected due to technicality that he did not have letters of recommendations from two people in the county where he lived. Now, although Medgar Evers was de denied admission to the University of Mississippi, Mississippi Law School in 1954, ultimately he was instrumental in the eventual desegre desegregation of Ole Miss in 1962. In 1954, Medgar Evers moved to Jackson, Jackson to become the NAACP's first field secretary of the Civil Rights Organization, where he traveled throughout the state to recruit members and organize voter registration drives and economic boycotts of white owned companies that practice discrimination. He also worked to investigate crimes perpetrated against blacks, of which his first assignment was notably the lynching of Emmett Till. Evers' activism made him the most visible civil rights leader in the state of Mississippi, and as a result, he and his family were subjected to numerous threats and violent actions over the years. At 12.40 a.m. on June 12, 1963, Medgar Evers was shot in the back in the driveway of his home in Jackson. He died, in less, than, he died less than an hour later at a nearby, nearby hospital. The man who shot him, Byron De La Beckwith, a white seg segregationist, was charged with his murder and was set free after two trials that resulted in hung juries. In December 1990, Beckwith was again indicted for the murder of Megger Evers, and the Mississippi Supreme Court finally ruled in favor of a third trial in April 1993. In February 1994, nearly 31 years after, his, after Evers' death, Beckwith was convicted and sent, sentenced to life in prison, where he died in January 2001 at the age of 80. Megger Evers was buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery and the NAACP posthumously awarded him their 1963 Spingen Medal, Medal. The national outrage over Evers' murder increased support for legislation that would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
And that is it from Edgar Evers. Okay, thank you. Before we go on to civil rights organization, I just want to point out that we are, um, our, the county, King County is named after the late and great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was significant in the civil rights movement. Um, Dr. King uh, did visit Seattle um, during that time and marched with Reverend Samuel uh, B. McKinney, uh, who was longtime pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church here in Seattle, Washington, and it's located in the Central District off of 19th and Madison. And so um, Mount Zion served as a hub um, for uh, activists to come organize and uh, come up with a plan uh, that was for our people. But it's also a place where I learned the books of the Bible song as a little girl. Uh, we'll go on to the civil rights organizations. So three of the oldest civil rights organizations in Washington um, have provided and made significant contributions in advocating for the rights of people and people of color. We'll initially start out with the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The, the goal is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic quality, equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and racial discrimination and to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights and there is no racial hatred or racial discrimination. The Seattle branch of the NAACP was founded in October, on October 23rd, 1913, and became the first of the national civil rights organizations to be established in the city. In the early years, the Seattle NAACP staged protest marches, filed lawsuits against discrimination, and sponsored celebrations of Emancipation Day and Lincoln's birthday. It also protested the showing of the anti-Black film, Birth of a Nation. The Great Depression of the 1930s, the NAACP sought to respond to economic crisis in Black Seattle. It took up many cases of employment discrimination and racial harassment. As Seattle's Black population grew during the 1940s, there was increasing segregation and exclusion in restaurants, theaters, motels, and rec recreational areas. The NAACP filed successful suits against many of the offenders and campaigned against discriminatory policies. During the civil rights movements of the 1960s, the branch was kept busy in court defending all the people who had been jailed in the marches and had created disturbances on the University of Washington campus and other sites in the city while protesting discrimination. During the 1960s and 70s, the branch assisted African Americans to gain employment in the, depart in, in the department stores Nordstrom, the Bon Marche and Frederick Nelson in grocery stores, including Safeway, Albertsons, and Tradewell, and in municipal agencies, agencies, including the fire department. For the past 20 years, the branch has concentrated on voter registration, humane law enforcement, and on young people while monitoring economic development and providing legal redress. Elimination of drugs and prostitution was the focus of a march at Judkins, Judkins Park. Through its act, so African Afro Academic Cultural Technological and Scientific Olympics program, the organization encourages and inspires Black youth toward excellence in academic and cultural pursuits. And that will be it for the NAACP. And we will now go on to the Urban League. The mission of the Urban League is to empower African Americans as well as other diverse undeserved, underserved communities to thrive by securing educational and economic opportunities. As the second oldest civil rights organization in the state of Washington, it is one of the region's essential economic first responders, helping families cope with challenges through a variety of programs designed to support and encourage self-sufficiency self in all aspects of life. They also serve as a liaison between community members, local businesses, city and county government, and other service-based organizations that share our concern for the welfare of the Black community and other disadvantaged residents in the greater Puget Sound area. These accomplishments are seen through education, housing, workforce, health, and policy and civic engagement. And that will do it for the Urban League. And finally, the ACLU, which the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU will always be on the side of fairness, equality, freedom, and justice for all. It is the nation's premier civil rights and civil liberties organization. 
It's an unwavering voice of freedom, fairness, and equality for all people in America. We work in the courts, the legislatures, and in our communities to protect and extend basic rights for everyone. The ACLU of Washington is one of the ACLU's largest state affiliates. In 1931, the Seattle ACLU Committee was formed, led by a UW student, a local lawyer, and a woman who was later to become a state senator. They work to ensure justice, freedom, and equality are realities for all people in Washington state, with particular attention to the rights of people and groups who have historically been disenfranchised. These would include young men stopped by the police because of its color of their skin, the 10-year-old immigrant girl forced to represent herself in court, the disabled grandmother who was refused an, an apartment because of a decades-old conviction, the woman told she may not have a hysterectomy in a religious-run hospital, the gay couple refused service at a flower shop, and many more. Their work includes the, uh, the student discipline, smart justice, put patients first, second chances, immigration rights project, trans transgender rights, and the voting rights. I challenge people to research, read, learn, teach, discuss, and understand our history. And don't be afraid to ask questions. And in, in ending, feel free to, to do additional research on these multiple achievements. And if, and if you like, please contact me and I can assist with guiding you through different locations. Thank you for your time. Well, Bernita, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough um, just for contributing to the group and really stepping up and taking a big piece of, out of the agenda. Um, before I turn it over to Vizaskia, I just want to say, you know, I think our group did great uh, providing the history of our um, of our trauma and uh, everything else in between. And with that being said, I'm just hopeful that one day um, more African Americans, the ones of today, will be seen as great contributors as as our ancestors were, and will allow us to have a seat at the table. Sasha, you're muted. Geez, I started off so good. You guys just missed out on all that stuff that I said about how amazing I am, but I'll start over. Um, I, I, again, I am Vizaskia Crockwell, Director of Equity and Social Justice for the King County Council. Uh, I am a black woman. I am a daughter to Zelodius and Robert Crockwell. I am a mother to three amazing daughters, Natasha Wyatt, and I'll say Dr. Wyatt. Nadia Caldwell and Nina Caldwell, who is an attorney. Um, I am a grandmother and I am a proud Washingtonian. Um, I am here today to really do the closing and some acknowledgements and I really want to take this opportunity to really honor and exalt the African American Affinity Group for putting this on today. Uh, I think that they were very intentional about providing the education that most of us lack in our lives. Um, African American history or the truth of it isn't told. So understanding the struggle of 450 years, um, this is the trauma that we walk in every day. And as we see the state of America, um, that struggle continues on. However, I do have hope today because there is a global unity. And I think that's what we want to celebrate. And in celebrating, it's always good to do that education. So I honor the African American Affinity Group and the leadership of Erica uh, Newman and Mike Reed and everyone that spoke today. We, we truly appreciate everything and for expressing your your experiences and I just really want to call out Chandler for truly sharing the your walk in this world and that day-to-day -day struggle um, so thank you for that I also want to honor the support and the leadership that um, the African-American affinity has group has received 
from our King County Council members. I would like to say that our chair, Claudia Balducci, when asked to read the proclamation and give words of recognition about what Juneteenth is, um, there wasn't a hesitation. You know, um, we need our white allies, regardless of what position they're in, to stand up with us now and walk beside us in this, this time of need. We share our stories at a time when we're all dealing with post-traumatic stress from years of trauma. Those 450 years understand they're happening to us right now as we walk and are expected to come to work and put that mask on. So like Mike's spoken word, we walk in a mask. It's so hard to be our authentic selves uh, out of fear of repercussions of what this society will think of us. So um, having our allies step in and step up and speak out on our behalf is critical. And council member Balducci does that every day. And our other council members, and there, there's a few that are on here, I honor you for doing this work because change doesn't happen without policy change. And they're doing that hard work right now. And um, they wanna be held accountable. So if you have ideas and suggestions to move initiatives forward, to change the struggle of African Americans in this country, reach out to them and speak your truth. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the fact that um, the support of our, our, our leadership um, to really be here, be present, and to support our staff and to being involved and engaged um, in this education, in this celebration, we thank you for that as well. Um, uh, you know what? We don't work in silos. I, I've been in this position for some time now. Um, well, not some time. It's almost a year. And, and I'm thankful for this position because I do believe this is my life's work. I've been doing racial and social justice for well over 30 years. But, you know, I started when I was two years old. So do not go there with me. But this is my life's work. And I'm really thankful to be doing it here but we don't operate in silos. So I'm really um, excited now because we are gonna break the silos between the legislative branch and the executive branch, the executive branch with their new um, Office of Equity and Social Justice Chief of Equity and Inclusion. Anita Whitfield is an amazing, incredible human being, and we will be working in solidarity to really address equity and social justice wherever it exists. Um, as you know, the state of America, race is an issue and it has to be addressed. But, and we can look at the issues, even as of just this week, the death of uh, Rashad Brooks in Atlanta, Georgia, where after he was shot in the back, a police officer stepped on his shoulders. Uh, these atrocities that happen are still more and more stress experienced by the black community, but I have hope. And I hope you have hope because there's been a global unity. It's not just in King County. It's not just in the United States. There is an acknowledgement about the anti-Black racism that exists in this country. And we are coming together, Black, White, Asian, Native Americans to say enough is enough. And we are going to work together to change the system and the struggles for Black people in this country and around the world. So I'm hopeful because we're seeing it and now we need to act. It's an, if we, we're not just talking the talk anymore. We have to act to change the, the treatment of blacks in this country. So I'm excited about that. And though we heard a lot of history and a lot of struggles, Juneteenth is truly about celebrating the liberation of blacks in this country. And um, we will be celebrating. We will be celebrating because tomorrow is the official Juneteenth and it's Jubilee, it's a Freedom Day where a lot of black communities come together and we sing, we dance, we eat our, our food, healthy foods, I'm a vegan, but we're eating and celebrating the fact that it is a liberation, you know, because we have come a long way, but without changing some of the policies and structures, we keep oppressing black people. So um, we will be celebrating, but that's not enough, okay? That's not enough. 
everyone on this call, there is a call to action today. So what can you do? You can get involved. Today you had an opportunity to get educated by some of the most incredible people from our legislative branch, our African American affinity group. Continue that education, get involved. Oftentimes I hear from my white allies, what can I do? Educate yourself, educate your peers and get involved. Um, I, I will, I'm gonna say this, um, I'm so very fortunate I work with um, my chief of staff, and I say that so you know who she is, it's Carolyn Bush, um, but she's more than that, she is my friend. And let me tell you, every day I speak out on the issues in this country around racism, social justice, but to be working for the King County Council and to work with the senior leadership team, um, there are days that I break down, there's days that I cry um, because of what goes on in this country. Well, when I'm in, at work and senior leadership, I don't have to put a mask on because before I have to say, this is what's going on, as my white ally, she steps in and steps up and she will speak out before I have to put my emotions on the table. And I thank her today, I honor her. She is more than just my supervisor, she is my friend. And so I know you're out there in the atmosphere and I know you're here and present today. And so I thank you for that. So again, as far as the call to action, all of you have heard a lot about the work of the Black Lives Matter movement. Go to a march, get involved. But in King County also, aside from Black Lives Matter, there's the King County Equity Now, and they're doing great work, and they march, and they educate, go to their website. There's a lot going on. Renita, you did a fantastic job today. Renita also told you about three organizations that you can get involved with the NAACP, the Urban League, and the ACLU. Educate yourself through them. I'm not at telling you to donate anything, but you can go to the site and you can get yourself educated. And then also, we're King County here. We're one King County, well, we're one King County. We're the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. Well, what I do know is that there is an equity and social justice office in both of our branches for the executive branch and legislative branch. You've got great leadership. They've got affinity groups. Get involved, not to listen, but to speak up and speak out. You can do that. You can do that in terms of celebrating Juneteenth. You can get involved. So in closing, um, I, I wanna say that King County, um, I always say, Washington State is the greatest state in the nation. And uh, I think King County sets the tone for that. I think we do a lot of great work and I think we can do more. And, um, and I ask you to do that. And finally, if you don't wanna do those things, I'll tell you one starting point for my white allies or white people that wanna be an ally. Reach out to one black person and be authentic and develop that relationship so that you can have true authentic conversations and understand what the struggle is and not just understand it, but become an active ally. And for my black sisters and brothers that are out there, we can't stand back and say, we're not telling anybody anything. To change the system, we have to work collaboratively and we do need to continue that education and that advocacy. So let's continue to speak out, continue to be authentic, speak your truth, walk in your truth, you know, wear your Afro if you need to, just be true to yourself. And I thank you all for coming today and um, enjoy Juneteenth, whatever way you need to do it because truly we are free. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our program. Thank you all. Until next time, see you.